came here um, this morning. So, um, as Francois says, um, I've been putting together all my experiences um, and knowledge um, about hormones. And I want to present to you some of the things that um, uh, I've been finding out about hormones and to share them with you. And I look forward to your um, questions at the end. So, um, why I've been putting all my thoughts together is because for the past year, or well, year and a half actually, I have been uh, writing a book all about this. So I want to give you a little flavour. Um, and I learned my, I learned um, a lot myself actually putting all these thoughts together. So I just want to give you a little flavour of why hormones are so vitally important um, for athletes, men and women, female athletes, by the way. I start off with this quote from Hippocrates, the father of medicine, over 2,000 years ago, he said the following, that if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. Um, clear Hippocrates would have been an absolutely excellent sports coach or dance coach um, because he was definitely onto something there. But of course, when he wrote that 2000 years ago, he didn't know why um, or how uh, these um, behaviours had such a profound effect on our health and therefore um, performance in athletic terms. We had to wait for the answer to, to this how and why um, for pretty much 2000 years. And it turns out that hormones um, are the key link here. Hormone comes from the ancient Greek, um, setting in motion. And that's literally what they do. They bring our DNA, DNA to life. So as we all know, DNA um, is the blueprint. It has the instructions in the cell nucleus. But what actually uh, determines what proteins are produced um, from that DNA message? And actually, what it turns out, it is the hormones that set this DNA in motion and they direct gene expression such that just the right amount of protein and the right one are correct are produced at the um, correct time. And that's really, really uh, crucial. So a little bit more about hormones then. Um, they are internal chemical messengers and they're carried in the bloodstream. And this is actually quite important if you think about it, because, of course, blood goes everywhere in the body. So one single hormone, let's take um, estradiol, the most active form of estrogen, as an example. Um, this uh, hormone can have multiple effects throughout the body, uh, throughout the different cells and tissues of the body. So we um, estradiol is very important for bone health, so it will have an effect on bone. It also has an effect on soft tissues, muscles, uh, ligaments, um, tendons, etc. And the brain and the gut, I mean, the list goes on. So this is the crucial thing about hormones. They can, they can get everywhere and have specific effects at those target organs. But not only are we talking about, of course, individual hormones, we're talking about, we have to remember the hormones act as a team, if you will, uh, as a network. So that was just an example of estradiol, but of course, that's linked with many other um, hormones. So this sort of illustrates why Hippocrates was right. Hormones have um, an effect on both physical and mental health. And also the feedback loop. Dès qu'on qu enregistre euh, l'écran d'un Mac. Can you all hear this okay? Normalement, il y a moyen d'enregistrer. Sure. Ouais. So, um, hormones affect um, health, mental and physical health. Um, but the interesting thing is that hormones are also connected with the outside, if you will. So, this is the the, the message that Hippocrates was trying to get over, that our behaviours in terms of exercise training, uh, nutrition and sleep, these uh, factors have an impact on our hormones. And you can see here, I've put all these feedback loops. So not only do the hormone, are, the, are these factors affected, um, impacting the hormones, but also the hormones go back and impact the, for example, effectiveness of, of right. training. And so this um, sort of um, sums it up, really, uh, I hope, that these external 
Um, Avec time. Just, um, yeah, just checking that there was no message there. Uh, uh, okay. Anyway, if you've got a question, then please, please ask it or we'll leave it till the end. But otherwise, if you could mute yourself, otherwise, I'm not sure <laughs> uh, if that was a question or not. Anyway, so this is um, what Hippocrates was getting at, that the behaviours of an athlete in terms of uh, training load, exercise, nutrition and recovery, um, these impact the hormone networks and that in turn determines our health and our performance. Ideally, of course, you want to get these three factors in the optimal range shown by this diagram. But that can be tricky and challenging because every athlete will be slightly uh, So I'll carry on. So hopefully... Um, just to sum up, if you were a little late arriving, um, what I've said so far, the hormones are these internal messengers uh, that um, have an impact on our health and our performance uh, as an athlete. Um, uh, and uh, I'm just going through these factors uh, that play such a crucial part uh, in our hormone health. So you might be surprised to see that I've actually put sleep as the top one. Uh, I'm not training because, um, as Macbeth says, or Shakespeare um, makes Macbeth say, sleep is the chief nourisher in life's great feast. And actually, you get fitter while you're asleep. I know that sounds slightly strange, but um, sleep is one of the main stimuli for hormone release. For example, growth hormone. Uh, the main stimulus for growth hormone relief is exercise, but also sleep. So we all know that when you're actually training, you're not getting fitter instantaneously at that moment. It has to be during recovery and particularly during sleep when the hormones will jump into action and make the positive adaptations uh, that you want and you're seeking from your training. To get, therefore, the most from your sleep and therefore your, um, your hormones is um, you must. It's really important for athletes to pay attention to sleep hygiene. I'm sure you're familiar. These are the strategies to make sure you get a good night's sleep um, in terms of having a bedtime routine. Don't look at computers <laughs> and mobile phones, etc. Uh, and also there's a recent study showing that actually when you go to bed is pretty important. Um, my grandmother always used to say to me, oh, it's important the hours of sleep we get before midnight. And, and it turns out she was right. Um, we now have a study showing that those hours, precious hours before midnight are actually quite important. So going to bed too late actually is very good. It, it will put the hormones out of sync, as we'll discuss later. Also, there's evidence that um, taking on board protein, especially casein protein, before you go to sleep, that will help uh, with uh, muscle repair. And recovery. Also, for some athletes, having a power nap during the day can be helpful, um, but don't take a nap before four, um, after 4 p.m., should I say. So take it um, early in the day and just limit it 20 minutes. Put an alarm on if um, you know athletes need this power nap. The other main um, area I just want to mention to you is nutrition. And this quote, fuel for the work required, actually come from work by um, Dr. Sam Impey, um, who was working um, with um, Professor James uh, Morton that you might have heard here in the UK. Um, and he advocates that we consider this, we, we should fuel for the work required. So what sort of athlete are you? How much energy will you be anticipating you might need on board to expend for this particular training session and do this on a forward-looking schedule. A um, lot of athletes will take a lot of time. Uh, we arrived here in Mallorca. and my husband was already making his bike and checking it out and all the details with the equipment, but actually thinking in advance about fueling is very, very important for the athlete, particularly around training. So for training, um, the athlete really does need uh, to have some energy on board in terms of complex carbohydrates. During training, of course, depending on the duration and intensity of the training session, um, for example, I think we're going out on a long bike ride tomorrow, at least four hours, so we're definitely going to have all our bottle cages filled up and our back pockets filled up uh, with nutrition to take on board as we go along. And also after training, it's really crucial within 20 minutes to re refuel with both complex carbohydrate and protein. Um, and that's why I've put the picture of milk and banana on the screen because um, an ideal 
post um, training recovery uh, nutrition is something like a banana milkshake. Um, in addition to getting the fueling right um, correct or as optimal around training, also it's quite important to have the athletes have regular meals of roughly equal sizes. I see lots of athletes who sort of skimp on nutrition in the earlier part of the day and then have a much larger evening meal. But actually, it's the consistency of the fueling will avoid mini energy deficits during the day because having those mini energy deficits um, will lead to hormone um, downregulation and you want these hormones to be working for you. So that's why um, I'm you know, advise athletes uh, to be cautious about fasted training and low carbohydrate intake because you need carbohydrate for high intensity um, exercise. And also athletes and can sometimes forget that there are other energy demands outside of training. It, lots of, uh, for example, some of these athletes, they cycle to the swimming pool. So already that they won't call that training. They would just call it commuting, but it's still using um, energy. It's not, of course, just a question of what, but when. The timing is really, really important of these factors because you have to bear in mind that the hormones themselves have time scales. Biochronometers is the word we use. So that, for example, uh, you may have heard that cortisol shows a diurnal variation. This means that there will be a peak production of cortisol in the morning, an awakening response, and then it will decline during the day. So there are many uh, hormones that have this particular um, internal biological clock. And you also have to think about your training uh, and your nutrition in terms of periodization um, from day to day, week to week, etc. As I've pointed out here over these big different life, uh, um, these timescales. But often it can be, it's tricky to integrate these things. So if you just focus on what you're doing without respecting or bearing in mind uh, the fluctuations in your own hormones uh, and the timing of these, then you can end up in this situation called circadian misalignment. So as I've said there, it's where these things are out of sync. What you're doing is out of sync with your biological uh, clocks. And this can have an adverse effect. So again, um, it's thinking about the timing of it in the broader picture is uh, really, really important. A little bit about female athletes um, of mice and men, as I've said here. Um, men and women are obviously different. I don't need to you know, go into the details of that, but you know, until relatively recently, um, you know, the default has been to apply the male blueprint to female athletes. And, you know, because the hormones are different, particularly the sex steroid hormones, obviously that's just not going to work. Um, so why is it not going to work? Because out of all the hormone systems, this is my favorite because it's beautiful. Look at that. We're talking about biological clocks and fine tuning timing. This is a this is uh, the, probably the most finely tuned and intricate of all the hormone networks in, ter in terms of the timing. You can see the fluctuations of the various hormones over this is a menstrual cycle. Um, and the point is that this is the timing of it, but every woman will be subtly different um, in their timing, maybe just slight differences in terms of the level of the hormones attained and uh, crucially, the biological response of the individual woman to these hormones. So not only are women's hormones totally different um, in terms of sex steroid hormones to men, but also even from woman to woman, they will be different. So this, you have to have a personalized approach uh, when we're talking about female hormones. And these are the crucial things that athletes and coaches need to know about menstrual cycles. Um, I think it's really important to emphasize that um, menstrual cycles are normal physiology. And so although the average age um, of starting periods called menarche is 12 years of age, we know that sometimes athletes, it can be a few years later, but absolutely the cutoff is by the 16th birthday if um, cycles have not started. 
whether you're an athlete or not, then this definitely needs looking into to see if um, there's a medical reason for this. The other points to emphasize that lots of athletes um, get anxious and say, oh, well, my cycle length isn't exactly 28 days. No, it, um, it's very unusual to find someone who is exactly 28 days. Anything between 22 and 32 days, this is from the start of one menstrual bleed to the um, start of the next. That's the gap I'm talking about, the, the cycle length. That's normal. OK, so there can be some variation on that. Um, but again, there is sort of there are cutoffs and that if the woman, the female athlete is reporting less than nine uh, periods per year, that's given a medical term. Uh, that's oligomenorrhea. And again, that needs uh, someone uh, with a medical experience to look into that. And absolutely, if periods stop for more than six months, then again, this has to uh, be assessed because there could be an underlying uh, medical reason for this. And I want to make clear that um, some athletes are told, oh, it's normal, it's fine if you're an athlete and your periods stop. I'm here to tell you that that's um, not correct. So um, whether you're a coach or an athlete yourself, um, please, um, you know, these are the facts about the cycles you really need to know. Um, a little bit more detail about the cycle, although um, these hormones are beautiful, uh, I have to say that they, they do come with some challenges. So the flashpoints for the menstrual cycle, in my experience working with female athletes, can be the menstruation um, part itself at the very beginning of the cycle. Uh, it can cause uh, cramps. And of course, there's blood loss and iron loss. We have to bear that in mind. But actually, research shows that doing some uh, form of exercise training uh, is helpful uh, for uh, any ex pain experience. Personally, I used to find that swimming was actually quite helpful for stretching out the muscles. The other flash point for the menstrual cycle is after ovulation in what's called the luteal phase, when progesterone, you can see, is the highest, the higher hormone, the dominant hormone, if you will. And this has an effect on increasing metabolic rate. So literally, there is a reason why some female athletes feel hot and bothered um, during this phase in the menstrual cycle and may need more recovery. So to emphasize menstrual cycles, normal physiology, um, and I think athletes should use these, take advantage of having menstrual cycles and use them uh, as a free monthly medical check effectively. They're the barometer of internal healthy hormones. If the hormones are varying as they should in a healthy fashion to support training adaptations, then um, the, the menstrual cycles will be reasonably uh, regular and it can indeed be used as a training metric um, in both athletes and dancers. I mean, I keep going on about menstrual cycles being important, but, uh, but what's the evidence I have why these are so important? You've seen already the fluctuations in the hormones that occur during the cycle. Um, these are very important for, well, three main aspects of health. Bone health. I've already mentioned that estradiol is the key hormone for bone health, by the way, in men as well, because in men, testosterone gets converted to estradiol. So bone health um, is very much dependent on estradiol levels and also soft tissue. We know athletes uh, in whom uh, periods have stopped and so therefore their hormone levels are low. They are definitely at increased risk of bone stress injuries and also soft tissue injuries. Cardiovascular health. These hormones are very important for cardiovascular health. If we uh, look at menopausal women whose um, ovarian hormones are very low, the main cause of death in menopausal women is actually cardiovascular disease. So, um, you know, and the reason is that these hormones are key for maintaining a good lipid profile, cholesterol levels, and also the reactivity of the arteries themselves. Neurological function, these female hormones are very important for neurological functions. Um, in studies, um, they found that female athletes who don't have periods have a slower reaction time and less peak power production. So although there can be challenges of having menstrual cycles, actually, you know, uh, they're really, really important, fundamental, not only for health, but certainly the performance of female athletes. Uh, and one way of assessing your athletes, um, and this is uh, work I've done with Francois, with athlete monitoring, um, we have uh, put together a nice menstrual um, monitoring uh, component of athlete monitoring. Very simple, very straightforward, nothing too complicated, but actually this is really helpful 
um, not only for me as the doctor, so I can see, uh, check that, uh, you know, my athletes, my dancers have regular cycles, but also we can identify if there are any flash points in the menstrual cycle that I can make suggestions for so that the dancer or indeed the, ath the athlete, uh, um, uh, you know, a football team, you'll know the both the um, the doctor and the player themselves, the athlete themselves will know, can predict where they might be in their cycle when they have to uh, perform, when there is a performance or a competition. So they can be prepared. It's all about being prepared, really. But, um, you know, what are the challenges? By the way, this is um, just as a little bit of an aside and an amusement. Um, on the left, that's actually my grandmother. Um, in the 1920s, she was in her early 20s. And then that's me on the right um, in the 19. 80s, I think, also about the same age. And just from these two pictures, you can see just visually that there's been an increased demand. I've got a, um, a different costume, tighter fitting, um, a more athletic look. This is what's happened in, in ballet, but of course we can see this across many areas of sport. So we have to try and meet these increased demands uh, for these athletes and support them in the best way we can. So I've shown you this diagram already. So this is um, really the sort of emphasis of this talk, that hormones are key to um, health and performance. And fortunately, we have the tools, as Hippocrates says, um, in terms of exercise, nutrition and recovery to really help athletes harness these hormones. But it is challenging and difficult. Um, and one of the challenges is what's called relative energy deficiency in sport, which sadly I'm seeing uh, a more and more common uh, occurrence. And this is when there's a mismatch between energy intake and energy demand. Um, and this leads to down regulation and problems with hormone networks. You can see the athlete in the center is looking very happy because they're taking on board sufficient energy to cover the energy demand from the training and they have sufficient energy to keep all the life processes, including hormones going. But these two athletes on either side, or it could even be the same athlete in a different situation, could end up in the red with insufficient energy. This athlete here on the right is unintentional. They just had very, very high training uh, load and demand. Um, but this athlete is the athlete we're particularly concerned about because intentionally they've restricted uh, the nutrition they're taking on board. I probably won't go through this diagram, but this is just a, sort of to show you visually. This is why hormone networks are so complicated and just one relatively small, you could say, imbalance in the terms of low energy availability, for example, is going to have a knock on effect on all these hormone networks. And that ultimately is going to be detrimental to the athlete's um, health and performance. Uh, and here we see that uh, the adverse effects on health and performance. And this is a diagram I often show to, to athletes and dancers I work with that um, I try to show them illustrate that they will never reach their full potential if they're not kind to their hormones, if they not haven't got that good balance of um, their athlete behaviours. Um, I'm just noticing time is getting on very fast, so I'm going to speed up a little bit, but I just want to finish with, um, you know, hopefully I've already convinced you that hormones are very, number one, complex, but very important to take into consideration. But also we have to think about the the athlete in terms of their age and their ability. Um, so I just want to, maybe I will just highlight these um, points. So in childhood, um, you know, trying to encourage children to train like adults, it's just not going to end well. And it's much better to be focusing on neuromuscular skills, um, which translate, I suppose, to technique of the sport rather than really hard um, endurance training, because they have not yet developed the energy systems to deal with that. Um, the teenage athlete um, is another sort of um, age of an athlete we need to consider, because this is when hormone, the sex steroid hormones are starting to, um, you know, pick up pace. And this is crucial for the um, approval of peak bone mass. So again, uh, you know, training alone needs to be monitored carefully. 
And my last few points are the Masters athletes. So spare us the thought, those of us that are getting a little bit older, um, you know, with age, yes, these hormones do decline, growth hormone, um, testosterone uh, in men, you can see, but the one that really takes die for women when they reach the menopause um, is uh, their female hormones, in particular estrogen. Uh, and it goes from having this nice uh, cyclical variation of hormones to being continuously sort of stuck, very low estrogen and progesterone. Um, and this has um, you know, profound impacts on, on how a woman feels. Uh, she can have many, um, you know, um, symptoms as I've listed there. Uh, and then we also have to consider that masters athletes, I mean, we're getting more and more of them, which I think is great. And we should be encouraging and supporting, um, these older athletes, but, uh, also, we need to consider that they're going to be spending a long time in the menopause to a third of their life. Um, of course, as ever, modifying lifestyle factors in terms of the training mode, uh, the nutrition and the recovery, those will have to change compared to an athlete in their 20s. But also for female athletes, I'm finding more and more that hormone replacement therapy for these athletes is actually very helpful so that they can continue to train and compete at the, the level uh, they want. So for female athletes, this is what I'm calling the female hormone odyssey. It's pretty complicated, but just to sort of walk you through this very quickly in the last few minutes. So children have very low levels. Then from the teenage years onwards, we have this lovely fluctuation of um, female hormones. Women can, of course, get pregnant. So you see that goes over there. Um, in uh, relative energy deficiency reds, the hormones can regress to low levels again. And then um, as the athlete gets older, becomes a master athlete, then we go over here in the right corner. So that's why it's a sort of a journey of the, of the hormones through the life, which I think is um, a good example of to, to really show you how things change um, according to your age. So just to wrap up in the last um, few minutes, um, and I look forward to your questions, by the way. Um, I hope I've convinced you, number one, that Hippocrates was right, but also because hormones drive the positive adaptations to exercise, um, if you want to be a better athlete, um, actually um, considering hormones um, and taking into account uh, the significance of them is really, um, I think, uh, important for the athlete and for the coach, of course. Um, so again, this, this sort of sums it up, just to remind you, these are the key athlete behaviors um, that uh, one can modify, uh, the exercise, nutrition, recovery, and getting the right balance and the right time of these will definitely support hormone function and hopefully uh, lead to um, the athlete's individual optimal health and performance. So um, that was just a flavor and a taste um, and I look forward to your questions. Um, and yeah, uh, if you want to find out more, then um, this is the book. Um, it's currently available um, on pre-order. And uh, if you are in the UK, I'd be running some uh, further discussion events. Um, we can talk about the dates and if, if people are in the UK and able to come. Um, so yeah, Francois, I managed to get there in the time. Phew. <laughs> Well, this was incredibly interesting. So thank you very much, um, Nikki, for uh, all this uh, great presentation. Uh, so I see that uh, we do have a few questions. Well, actually, you do have a few questions because uh, I would be very embarrassed to, embarrassed to try to answer them. So um, maybe if you can address them and, and then we can welcome uh, a few other questions uh, directly. So you um, unmute yourself and then you ask the question. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Francois. So um, I will read out this question, uh, frankly, to give myself thinking time as well. So we have a question here saying that after a long time of down regulation of hormones um, with amenorrhea, that's lack of periods for 10 years, for example, is it unreasonable to expect normal hormone function to reestablish after EDS? OK. Um, and can the negative effects be reversed? Um, thank you for that question. Um, if there is, I suppose I should say, first of all, REDS 
relative energy efficiency in sport, in, in sport is a functional problem with the hormones. In other words, um, as a doctor, I must always exclude that there's a medical cause why a woman's periods have stopped because I've told you that they are normal, natural physiology. So um, if we, um, I've looked at the blood test and it's yes, this is definitely a functional issue and I can exclude medical conditions, then it is reversible, absolutely. Um, after even a very long duration of time, provided of course the woman um, you know, is, isn't over 50 and menopausal, then of course we can't, the periods won't restore. But, um, you know, it is reversible, but that's not to say it's easy or straightforward because obviously if you've been in an amenorrheic state for a very long time, it's gonna take a lot to reawaken um, the hormones, but it is absolutely possible. Uh, but it also will t depend on how that person uh, arrive there for such a duration I would suspect this is more the intentional uh, situation where the athlete has been intentionally restricting what uh, they're eating and um, intentionally doing a lot of training in other words they've got a long-standing energy deficit so just uh, just as you if you get a really bad and um, overdrawn bank balance right it takes a long time to repay that doesn't it unfortunately with interest it's a similar thing for um, down regulation of hormones. If it's been, they've been suppressed for a long time, then actually it will, it will take, it will absolutely take hard work. There's no denying that. And especially psychological hard work to overcome those um, negative uh, thoughts and feelings but, uh, towards, uh, you know, nutrition. But absolutely, it is it is possible to restore the hormones. Um, and what can, therefore, the negative effects be reversed? Well, um, that's also difficult to say because, for example, um, it was mentioned here, cardiovascular health, but I've got more evidence for bone health. We know that um, bone health will suffer, no doubt about it. Uh, and we also know that... Um, uh, restoring hormones will definitely improve the bone health. Whether we can confidently say, oh, we'll get your bone health back to where it was before, that's it's not possible to say that because unless there's an identical twin who didn't whose periods didn't stop, then we have we don't know what the genetic potential was of that individual. But again, reassuringly, we have evidence that um, some of these negative effects um, are reversible, but to what extent? It's difficult to say, um, to be absolutely honest with you. Um, but sometimes we give athletes uh, it, with prolonged amenorrhea, we give them HRT to provide bone protection um, in the short term. So, um, sorry, I tend to have given a very, very long answer, but it's a very important topic. And in, in that um I will actually read out someone else's comment on that, if that's all right. It says, uh, yes, it took um, this individual two years with psychological and nutritional work to restore uh, an aesthetic athlete. Yes. And uh, and we quite uh, the coach. We must always work with coaches. Um, so that's absolutely my approach, by the way, to help these athletes. Uh, restore hormone networks. I know we're focusing on women, but by the way, this does happen. I've seen a lot in men as well, especially male cyc cyclists. So of course I work with the individual from the psychological point of view to really find out, you know, I try and help them overcome their concerns. Um, and of course I have a, I'm very fortunate. I've got a, a dietitian colleague who helps um, in that regard. But the other key person in this is the coach. Um, and so I always ask the athlete, can we have a three-way conversation with your coach? Because there's no point me advising them, listen, you need to decrease your training intensity for the time being and increase your um, energy intake, et cetera. But then there's no point me saying that if then they the coach isn't aware and the coach is still maybe giving them the same intensity of uh, training. So absolutely, it's very important in my experience, to try and get the coach on board. But if you explain to the coach that this is for 
the performance of the athlete, then they're more likely to uh, listen and, and pay attention because, because it truly is. So um, that's very important. And then someone is also agreeing about um, medical professionals and coaches aware and up to date with current guidelines. Yes, by the way, on that topic, um, I wrote a website um, for the British Association of Sports and Exercise Medicine called healthforperformance.co.uk and it gives information for the athlete, for the coach, for the healthcare professional, for the parent, so that everyone is on the same page because it has to be a team um, effort. And also the other thing about giving the correct information and guidelines is a very good point because I've mentioned already that um, HRT uh, is bone protective in these female athletes whose periods have stopped and have got poor bone health um, under the criteria set by the IOC, by the way. But unfortunately, up until relatively recently, and I and indeed even now, sometimes athletes are offered the combined oral contraceptive pill, otherwise known as the birth control pill. And um, it makes everyone feel better psychologically that as a doctor prescribing something, you feel better. Um, and the athlete will have withdrawal bleeds, but absolutely this is not the correct way of managing this situation because the combined oral contraceptive pill is not bone protective. And I'm really pleased. This is already in the Endocrine Society guidelines, but um, earlier this year, I managed to um, persuade, or actually not persuade, I asked nice the NICE guidelines here in the UK, if they could change the um, advice, and they, they have. So again, I refer athletes, if you're having, if you're being told that you should take the combined oral contraceptive pill, your periods are stopped to protect bone health, please um, <laughs> uh, don't. Uh, um, show them the Bayesian website, show them the NICE guidelines if you're in the UK, show them the Endocrine Society guidelines if you're in the US. Um, because that is not now, uh, it's not the best for treatment and, and management. Um, any other questions? Because I realise I'm infringing on your um, evening time. Um, I'm just going to put health for performance dot co dot uk. Oops, sorry. I'm just trying to spell this the website that. Um, we will also share the link uh, in the email um, oh, I'll thanks. send you with the, uh, the recording as well so everyone right. will, uh, will have access to this resource and uh, I'm sure that's a relief because I can't I can't spell it properly sorry yeah, yeah just email it there we go <laughs> there we go there we are that, that's that's I think <laughs> correct spelling yes um, uh, any other questions anything Francois that you want to highlight I think that um, actually for female athletes, because not all female athletes have the resources, uh, you know, but for example, this is a free website, information website, and also uh, what we have at Athlete Monitoring, Francoise, you know, the, having that menstrual tracker is handy. So I think there are, and just getting the information out there. So all these people who are listening and will listen to this, this webinar, um, you know, we we each almost can go out and disseminate this information. And of course, I have to shamelessly, if you don't mind, Francois, uh, <laughs> plug my book. Um, you know, the book is, um, it's not expensive and it's not a medical textbook to reassure you. It'll be written sort of in the language of, I've used us just now, so hopefully that everyone can, you know, understand it. But nevertheless, it is based on absolute uh, facts and information. And there are lots of references in the book um so yeah get your order in quick if you want to get a 20 percent discount and you don't mind francois i've been plugging i hope um people can go and pre-order their book uh and if you enter the discount code nikki the spelling of my name n-i-c-k-y you get 20 percent off so that's worth it isn't it and if you are in the uk um also i'm doing some discussion events to go for into even further detail um at Cambridge University where I trained originally on the 6th of November um, at UCL where I'm working at the moment on the 9th of November 
and then Rafa Cycling Club in London on the 21st of November. And it will be me, but I'll be joined by, you know, various guests. It won't just me be me giving a monologue. You'll be pleased to know there'll be some athletes who will be coming along and, um, you know, participating, giving their views and everything. So if you are in the UK and you're free on those dates, please come. Um, those are also uh, free events as well. Um, so there we go. If there are no any other questions, anything else, Francois, we should um, highlight. Well, I think uh, it was an extremely interesting uh, discussion and presentation. Um, so we'll be uh, we'll be sharing the link to download the webinar, so you'll have the, the opportunity of viewing it uh, when when you want, and also to share it. Feel free to share it as well. Because um, the more this type of information is uh, is going out, the best it will be for the athlete at the end. Uh, mm -hmm. So coaches as well, uh, especially for the book and the different resources. We also put the resources on our uh, on the athlete monitoring website. We put we don't put a lot of resources there, but when they are good one, then we like to have them. So um, so thank you all. Uh, oh well, there is one last question. That's going to be the last one from. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I can see it here. Um, so, uh, do you combine hormones and blood work um, as biomarkers? Um, by uh, combined hormone, combine hormones and blood work as biomarkers. So, um, yeah. I mean, when I do, when I suggest a blood test, I have to say yes. Um, the blood test will contain a lot of hormones. If you know what I mean, I will be looking at a lot of hormones in detail, the female hormones, the male hormones, thyroid function is very helpful, um, but also other biomarkers that aren't hormones um, in the sense of, you know, iron levels, ferritin. Uh, by the way, vitamin D is a hormone. Hmm, interesting. Anyway, um, so I do look at other things, not just hormones, but if, um, if that answers your question. So I also would consider doing full blood count, um, uh, ferritin B12, I would often do. So I hope that um, answers your question. And yes, Francois, I, oh, good. And Francois, I've just put there, I know you're going to put it in the resources. That's the link. Um, if that's okay, I'll put it there, Francois, to um, my book that I was talking about, um, where you can get the your where you can get your 20% discount. 